Welcome back to Visited by Voices Live on Monday the 29th. I am over the moon to be joined tonight by actress, director, columnist, model, and Rondo, Rondo Award nominee for her column, Diary of the Dead, Miss Debbie Rashan. Hey, Debbie, how are Thanks. you? Good. Can you hear me, perhaps? We can hear you. Excellent. Okay. Perfect. And I'm a Rondo Hatton Award winner for my. Oh, home. I am sorry. That is a horrible thing I just did to you. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. It's perfect. As a matter of fact, the timing is perfect for you to bring that up because people need to vote now. They have a couple more weeks for this year's Rondo Hatton Classic Awards show. So, reminder to the folks to get out there and vote. Always vote. Email. It always matters, but for the Rondos <laughs> vote, especially. Yes. 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 Absolutely. I love your show, by the way. I love your introduction. Awesome. Awesome. I love the space. Well, thank you. Really nice. Thank you very much. Um, it's a one-man show at this point, so everything, all the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into it all comes out of me. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Listen, I, I want I wanted to start with kind of what where we left off before we started the show, which is, uh, you know, for all you out there, I'm sorry you missed it, but we'll, we'll catch up. Yeah. Let's start with that that not title. So oh, you are not title. a scream yeah. queen. Right. Well, you kind of are. Right. People use a handle for you um, and you're not because you don't call yourself that. In other words, if you go to my website, I don't describe myself in my bio if I've written it with those terms, but other people for many, many years have put me on the lists in the magazines called that perhaps, or they've always labeled me because pe labels are really super easy, super, super easy, right? So if you could put somebody in a particular label or corner or, you know, title, whether it be indie or horror or cult, um, and even you get into the subgenres, you know, Scream Queen or the equivalent, uh, there's now Scream King. Um, and some people like that. They want that and they own it and they put it as their own descriptive phrase. For me, it's like, I don't know. I, I always like doing things. I kind of happened into it. I never aspired to be it. So for me, it's kind of like, well, you know, right now, my favorite thing to do is write, actually. So I don't know. Is there uh, a new f column for just Scream Queen writers? I mean, when I was coming up, it was uh, the only thing that that really meant, which is not the case anymore. Keep that in mind. But it just was a very sort of derogatory term to call a woman in a horror movie. She probably can't act. She will uh, definitely get naked and she'll be a victim and scream and won't be the killer. So, I mean, it's always been, hmm, well, some of that's true some of the time and some of that's the opposite more often of the time. So, I don't know. Well, it's a weird sort of pejorative, too, because you see the word thrown around so loosely that uh, someone like a Barbara Steele, who almost never played a victim, is called a scream queen. She also oh. didn't do a whole lot of screaming in her movies. So oh. I could definitely see how it could color your passion for what you do. Um, and well, it still yeah. meant, it's still kind of meant as a celebration, and that has to be nice. But you know what? Ultimately, yeah. what I used in the description was actress, right? Yeah, that, exactly. That's really and what it that, is. And that's really what it is. And I'm more into how people view it or use it now, like right, right now, than even up to five years ago, for example. I mean, because you could 10 years ago or more or any time prior to that, but 10 years ago and backwards, uh, you know, called Jamie Lee Curtis that and she would not be impressed. She would not be no. pleased um, because she was always, you know, the strong, even if she had to fight to find her strength, she was always the strong one or Sigourney Weaver and aliens. People all scream queen. 
Not really. I mean, she's, uh, you know, pretty damn strong in those movies, I'd say. But um, it, like I say, it just becomes a handle. And then by now it's sort of either, you know, watered down to the point of, you know, not being too much of a big deal, one extreme or the other, or there are still people that use it as sort of a derogatory term. So I guess it depends on the intent. And at the end of the day, if something's fun and it's not intended to be bad, who really cares? Um, you know, it doesn't, I'm not overly sensitive person. And I think um, if you're going to be in this business for the amount of like kicking around, especially the, the era that I grew up in, in film, you get a lot of kicking around, a lot. <laughs> and if you're not up for that, then perhaps it's not the right field to be in. We have an hour with you, so I don't want. I well, I can't. <laughs> I actually do. Want, <laughs> I'm just but, gonna take you down some rabbit holes. Well, well, no, you see, no. Here's the thing. Um, I would love to go through your discography and just talk about um all of the films that you've been in, but that's impossible. So, um, because it's my show, I'm gonna be pretty um pretty ruthless about covering what I want to cover. But Good. in the chat, you guys, when you have questions, I will relay them. I'm gonna do a little bit of uh of laying the scenery first before I go to the questions in the chat because there already are a few up there. Also a couple comments. If you want to express your love for Debbie, I will put it up on screen. She'll she'll see, I promise. But um I want to go back to 1988. Early days, right? Yeah. You were you were cast in a film called Negatives alongside yeah. the great Dwayne Jones. Now this film never actually was properly um, completed, although it eventually footage from it morphed into something called Fright House. That's right. That's right. You, I mean, that had to be a intense way that early in your career to to start rolling some uh, rolling some tape. Yes, absolutely was. And seeing my part, the only bit of my part that had been shot before they shut down production because they ran out of money and the funding that they were to get for the second part of it never came through, and the crew walked because all of their checks were either bouncing or they weren't getting them. So this was like right in the middle. And I, the only thing I had filmed at that point, being like a side character, supporting character, um, was my death by vending machine. There was a, like a, a soda machine that, you know, I'm, I'm putting my, I'm putting money in, I choose something and I'm, nothing's coming out. So I'm trying to grab it and it like brings me up into the machine and kills me but all the scenes prior hadn't shot yet. So when they did take those few loose scenes and try to morph it into another entity, that didn't make any sense. Although I always thought they kind of wasted an expensive death scene, but regardless, yeah. That, but meeting Dwayne Jones, which was really your point, was in fact not only amazing because he was insanely nice and such a good good man he was the type of guy that just would he was so excited to help everybody and and he had been around the block like he had done a lot of stuff at that point uh like you said he was 88 right so yeah. you know that was 20 years since uh he had made night so he had um a lot of work and he did did a lot of stage and stuff anyway so he was amazingly nice. And then it was like very fortuitous in the sense that I would spend all of my adult life and career working with and talking with and knowing all of the people from Night of the Living Dead in, you know, John Russo, been in every movie that he's directed since um, Santa Claus in 96, everything that he's done since then. I've, I've had other big parts or small parts in them, but we've remained friends and for the entire, and Russ Streiner, we're still very good friends. And um, yeah, Bill Heinzman, his whole, t whole life before he passed away. And anyway, so the night connection was just right out of the gate and weird because, you know, I, even though that movie never came out negatives, um, it was, and it's a shame. It would have been super, it was a very cool idea. Um, yeah, sort of like met Dwayne Jones and then, just would sort of go on to meet all the other cool guys and gals that had to do with night. Um, 
so yeah, it was it was very interesting and odd. And people, some people say, oh, it was just because it's all East Coast, you were bound to, but not necessarily. I mean, not really. It just kind of, I felt it was meant to be, meant to be. That's awesome. And, um, so what, yeah, how this is going to work, I guess I'm going to give him one for me and one for the chat. So it's the chat's turn. Uh, Dan Schein, the <laughs> chat, from, from Flesh Wound Features, asks, uh, longtime fan, Debbie, and I used to see you in D. Snyder over many Fangoria Weekend of Horror events. Do you have any fun stories from Fangoria Radio? Oh, my God. Oh, my. Which one? Which one? Oh, my God. Which one? Well, I mean, there's there's a lot of very fun and funny stories, and they may seem either weird or out of context if I tell them now, but you have to understand, if you're listening to the radio show like you were, I'm speaking to, to you, Dan, that you n understand that, you know, this particular joke that we had. Okay, well, there's a couple of them. One was, I'll start off with uh, Ben Foster. I interviewed him by myself, like during the day when it was convenient for him. And we played it on the show later that night. And um, the interviews with, uh, you know how it is, um, booking people in the film business. You, you really got between 10 and maybe 15 minutes tops with any particular person. So you're really trying to, to you know, pull something out and, and go for something. So with Ben Foster, famous actor, right? He was in, uh, what, Ten to Yuma, and, uh, I think, and we was in a bunch of stuff. Very amazing actor, amazing. So it was just me and him, did the interview, played it that night on the show, and we were both like, wow, like some actors are so introverted, and they're just not kind of built for the, the publicity thing. Like, you know, you have to have a certain personality to be entertaining or engaging or or something you, if you're really sort of you know pull every word you're trying to pull out of them it's not easy as the interviewer so basically d came up with <laughs> ben foster there's an old commercial for foster is australian for beer okay that was happening at that time it was famous commercial so we said ben foster is australian for a bad interview <laughs> but i take on i take on the also responsibility because as an interview uh -er, you must also make it interesting so i don't it was just a, it was one of those things where you have radio jokes you know they're not meant um intentionally harmful but they're in the moment funny and so that was, that was just one of many times, many, many times where, I mean, Darren uh, Bousman, who did so many great films, including the, the opera. Um, Repo. Uh, yes, thank you. Repo. And, you know, so we were such fans of his work, like massive fans of his work. But I had just come from Germany where I did a film and I said, uh, Blausen in uh german means blow job and i said to d on the air i said wouldn't it would do you think it would be funny if we just refer to him darren blausen and he's just thinking that we're getting his name wrong but in fact you know and the, the audience is in on it right because they're hearing us like plan this out and figure it out and so we, you know, had him on and, you know, he was nothing but class. And we were the ones that with our, you know, grade or age 14 humor saying, thank you, Darren Blouse. And that was amazing, you know, cause you know, we're, we're kids and we're silly and stupid, but he was a class act. Um, but then we did turn it around on D one time and then I'll let you get to an actual question. I'm sorry. There's so many cause we were, Four, four years of the show. So, um, but one time Lloyd Kaufman came on and he was co hosting with me. And um, Dee was up and uh, doing some twisted show for a small group of people. It was a special event and he was up there. So he w was just about to go on maybe a couple of hours from, from then. And we had Lloyd call in to the show. Um, acting like he was like the frantic 
boyfriend to Dee Snyder and he hadn't heard from him and he wanted to, um, you know, find out, you know, how could he get a room there? He was he was going to be arriving and, and he needs to be put through to Dee Snyder, who's, you know, his significant other. And it was just and the guy didn't know what because he probably knew Dee's wife. He was probably with them. But it was funny. And again, you had to be there. You had to be there. But he kind of he kind of got a little bit back on that one because, you know, he had some splaining to do, Cause it, you know. Well, that's a great so, transition. It, yeah, it was. Uh, that's and so many things like that. But like I say, you you have to like be there for the full, you know, flow of the show to get it. But I know the person who asked the question was there and totally gets what I'm saying. So there you go. Yeah. So many, so many of those moments. Isn't it great, though? Those great memories. Definitely. You got to ride in the seat over the wheel well of the bus long enough to feel the potholes. That's how it goes. But yeah. <laughs> um, so that actually is a good transition because uh, you your connection, at least publicly, with Troma and Lloyd Kaufman is mm -hmm. uh, pretty extensive. And mm -hmm. it's, it's what I think most people would associate with you. Not really me, but we'll get to that. Right. Um, so tell us about the trauma experience. I mean, because that has to be a whirlwind of both confusion and uh, pure delight at the same time. Yes, most definitely. I first met Lloyd in 92 and started doing, um, well, I was actually writing an article about him for a magazine. That's how I met him. And started doing like some uh, fake poster art. They would pick up movies from overseas and reshoot the poster art with the people in New York City, uh, recreate that. So did that, did the like cable channel bumpers in between uh, movies, cause so many new cable channels were coming out at that time. So they kind of wanted bumpers in between the, the trauma movies. So trauma was so happy to have their movies played, be it um, in Germany or wasn't just the US, it was like whatever country that they would write like bumpers to, to introduce, have like a little comedy and introduce the next movie and stuff like that. So we did a whole bunch of that stuff and, and in-person stuff and on Comedy Central, I think it was even called Ha Still, the first, incarnation of comedy central i guess it's not even comedy central anymore is it but the first incarnation was ha channel like ha that's it and uh so we did stuff there and a fake um 800 uh line commercial and you know that's when bill maher was there and um oh it was crazy and so we did that and then the first actual movie i did of course was tromeo and juliet shot in 1960 or 1960 oh my god 1996. <laughs> i don't think it was that far back. Eight. i think it would have had a different reaction if it had been released in the 60s and it, there was a, a romeo and juliet that was released in the 60s a little bit Isn't different that fun? yeah but it Boy, maybe it just feels like that long ago. Um, but yeah, oh my goodness. Yeah, but it, it kind of does in a lot of ways. But, but um, yeah, so just, you know, worked at uh, two more pretty big movies regarding uh, movies with trauma, um, like how they, they were like kind of seminal for the 90s because trauma had the big 80s, right? They had their, their teenage classics from the 70s and then they had their whole toxi 80s and then it kind of waned from about i want to say 88 until 96 until tromeo came out again and it was something that was so different and it just grabbed the new fresh age group and reinvigorated the older fans as well and then Terra Firmer, not long after, which is my personal favorite movie I've done with Lloyd. And then Citizen Toxie in 99. So the 90s were sort of um, the three big ones. And the other movies I've been involved with with Lloyd, they've been sort of like either cameos or, or supporting roles, like in Shakespeare's Shitstorm. I'm in the whole film, but I'm like his sidekick and he plays brother, twin brother and sister. So, you know, 
the fact that even one of them has a sidekick with all that that, that screen screen time that he has but he's hilarious but yeah so i've always um you know i've even gone through that period of time where uh i was i had done so much else that i was really proud of because i came out of the theater and studying and all that kind of stuff in new york right so I wanted, I was, I was really wanting to um, at least get people to try to watch, try to get people to watch, you know, some of the other stuff that I've done, like it was all serious or, you know, just, or just different kinds of art and really like trying to get people to go down that road. Like, this is great. Check this out. And it was, it was really hard to do, you know, it was really, really hard to do, to get people to, to do that. And it was really important to me. So was, I was a little frustrated um, because it just wouldn't stop. It would just be like, you know, trauma actress, which is, again, completely fine. I own that. I totally own that. I will, you know, go to my grave being very proud of the work that I did with Lloyd. But if you think about it, say I've done six, seven movies with him, but I've made, you know, 260 movies. That's exactly. a small amount. But hit trauma having such a massive fan base, that's why it's sort of become what it is, which yeah. is a good thing. Well, I, th I think you were important to, to a very um sensitive time for the company. That was kind of make or break. If they didn't have that period, whereas you know, uh, Tara Firmer and those films really reset the company. I'm not sure that, I mean, Troma's endured a lot, but no company is eternal unless they stay relevant. And you were a, kind of the safe face of the company at a very vital time. So I I think it's a, a love-hate thing probably because, you know, I, I, you want to escape from the shadow when you want to escape the shadow, but the shadow sometimes is a, a nice piece of shade to sit under too. Yeah. I, I agree with you too, because, you know, it's, it's what everybody kind of goes through. You know, they want to go through, um, you know, like when Trent moved, Trent Haig, I mean, moved to LA with his, his beautiful wife before they had kids, they moved out there. And, you know, the first thing everybody told him, get trauma off your resume, get it off. If you want to be taken seriously and get some real work. And uh, so, I mean, all of us, who have given so much, whether it was for a short period of time or our entire careers, um, have always been, you know, kind of looked down upon for our time there, whether it be short, like I say, or long. So it's, um, it's, but for me, I just came to the point where I'm like, I love the art of Lloyd. I love Lloyd. I love his wife. I love the insanity. I love, um, even though some movies I like better than others, I, I love that they have something to say. I don't, you know, I, I like that the fact that they're so anti-Hollywood and it forces the world to have other choices, whether they want it or not. Like, let's keep that sort of indie stuff alive, even in a time where, you know, people are really, really sensitive about stuff. And so you have to be so careful and everything. And even with Lloyd, you know, he it's not like he's not careful. He's thoughtful. There's a difference. He's not fearful. He's thoughtful in what he does and what he's parroting. So um, I just have come to the point where I've made the full circle, the full on circle of background again. And I am just, you know, I love trauma and I love what it stands for and that it's really the last punk rock film studio left standing because there used to be New Line in New York City. There used to be a couple and certainly Full Moon is great, but it's got a different sensibility. It's a little bit more serious. It's not as like crazy edgy. But when you get when you mix in that crazy edgy, you can also be written off by people like that's, you know, that's a little silly and outrageous and stupid. Well, he's saying a lot of stuff and he's keeping your attention by making it super visual. Like Lloyd is really obsessed with or was obsessed with 
um, Mad Magazine, where there was so much going on in every single frame that e that even be like little cartoons down the the sides of the um, edges of the outside of the box, like you know, down the sides yeah. of the page. If you something ever was always that. messing with the page number. Yep. Right. Yep. Thank you. Exactly. And that is exactly how Lloyd sees the frames in his movies. And just, you know, there's stuff just going on like a mile back, you know, if you're able to see it or catch it, there's something going on that he has planned. It's not like he throws a bunch of people in front of a camera, go. It's like, no, every single silly thing, no matter how cool or silly or funny or whatever it is, it's been micromanaged and rehearsed you know what i mean so it's yeah i always i, love I always it. thought of, I'll, i want to leave trauma behind in just a second because it i don't want to get bogged down there because we have other things to discuss but uh i always thought of trauma as sort of a, the precursor to south park in a lot of ways and that there would be social issues being discussed but it was all through a very specific lens of absurdism Yes. And um, I think too often people just look at the um, grimier side and some of the acquisitions they made as opposed to the films that actually yes. the core of they produced, um, which is, again, what are you going to do? It's a company. Um, thank but, you. And thank you for saying that. And I'm, I apologize if I've cut you off, but I, I just, just want to acknowledge what you have said. Their acquisitions are not them per se yes they're trauma but that's not lloyd's art so yes very it that is so important to understanding the company so i thank you for being it's nice talking to a smart person a lot of uh -oh. people they got to separate so to analyze and separate this stuff because you know let's face it unless you know a company you may not know all these sort of you know intricacies i guess you would call them listen i just got to protect the east coast that's what it's about that's <laughs> right that's that's our job so our friend of the show piz asks uh says the first movie i remember seeing debbie in was witch house three which looked like a lot with a fun movie to shoot being someone with such a prestigious res resume what movies were the most fun to shoot well yeah thanks for bringing up uh witch house three because that was the first Jared Bookwalter uh, directed it, and uh, Jason Walsh did an excellent job with the script and wrote that. And that was the first full moon movie of four that I did for that company um, and went out to L.A. and did it. I just finished American Nightmare. So um, once I finished American Nightmare, people got out of the headset. This is not a put down to trauma. This is like a people realizing oh she can not just do be silly which in your acting training you train to do absurdist comedy drama like you know um all different styles of acting whether it be pinter where everything's inside and you're not saying anything and you're saying how's your tea but inside you've got a million feelings going on that are never expressed verbally with every playwright with every everything it's 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 its own thing so to me it was like okay trauma it's like absurdist comedy i studied you know at uh, chicago city limits i studied uh, improv so it's like this is perfect okay it's like bringing these two together so then you go on to full moon and it's more serious a little bit more i wouldn't say melodramatic i mean it was very well written so i don't mean anything derogatory but it was definitely more you know drama mixed with horror you know with with the the whole witch essence now as far as fun movies go i uh, the tough thing is like to me fun is always like when you're doing something that's insanely creative um it's not like necessarily a knee slapper fun so Boy, oh boy, like there's a, there's a number of times I certainly would include American Nightmare. I would include Hellblock 13, which was very campy, but still it was like really it was there was a satisfying element to making that color from the dark was really, really, really satisfying for me to make. That's the title we're going to um, get to. <laughs> yeah, that was just really like just 
to have like and even bleed a movie like bleed which they cut so much out of the script before we even uh shot it because it was on you know such a tight budget it was far more complicated and made a lot more sense before they took the 20 pages out that they did so um it's not that i have to be the lead or even second lead but i have to if i can get a character that's really kind of messed up a complicated character, something to really, you know, sink my teeth into and just go create and take big chances with and like be the kind of actor that I respect and go, I go crazy watching, you know, I'm just like, oh, that actor, like, you know, any, any actor from the American Horror Story, be it, you know, Evan Peters for, for the guys or, you know, it, any of the female actors, any one of them, because the writing's so good for women on that show. Um, but I can eat Joe Spinell, like so many of these actors, especially from, I want to say 70s, uh, maybe 80s, certainly the 90s when indie became popular again. Um, they, they really took risks. And that is where it's at. Like that is the, that's the satisfaction stuff. Like when it's a combination of, if it's not like a really tight script and, and they want you to really uh, enjoy yourself by improvising and you're able to, that is the stuff right there that just makes, it makes the gold, you know, it's this sort of like perfect opportunity as an actor. So, and, it, and it's kind of therapeutic in a way. It's really crazy. So I'm actually going to go away from my notes for a second and just combine two things because I want to make sure they both get in. Uh, 2008, you make Color from the Dark with uh, Ivan Sacon. Uh, mm -hmm. He is one of my favorite wow. filmmakers, period. I think he has one of the most insanely creative visual eyes for composition that is working today. And it's a crime that a major studio hasn't gotten behind him to give him full access to every tool in their toolbox. But in that role, you play Lucia, mm -hmm. and oh my God, did it open my eyes to you as an actress. I That film allows you to do so much in headspace that I just don't feel like you had been properly allowed to do before. Um, everything from extreme vulnerability to um, very scary, and then mm -hmm. tragic all over it. Like just a wide paint of tragic over that whole story and your performance. It's an amazing film and, and it's an amazing performance from you in that film. Anything you could tell us about that production? Because I would love to hear just more about it. Oh boy. All I, all I can say is, you know, when I went over to Italy, that was the first of two movies I made with him. And all mm -hmm. I can say is when, when you meet Ivan Zucon, you meet somebody who is in another dimension of not just talent, but like it's his it's his passion and obsession with detail. Like like you said, why the hell has a studio not picked this man up? Why why why? Be it in that country, this country, I don't care what country. How can you not see? what this guy is doing and he's like, you know, bending pennies and twisting them and making this. Can you imagine what he can do? There's no limit to what that man can do because everything that you see, I mean, there's, there's some exceptions. Yes. But everything that you see on his, in his movies, I mean, there it's practical. I mean, it was shot it was shot and and the guy he's a just a powerhouse a writer editor director lighter you know ev everything i mean he would i don't think he did music and that was probably the only thing he didn't do but he had an eye for casting i felt like he was genius caster like he really knew how to use people to the best of their abilities and um man oh man so that we were shooting color in uh, this old barn and his father, who is like his biggest supporter of, of anybody, which is like, there's so many of us that are, but his father is like, he builds like the sets for him. 
like from scratch. Like, the, yes, the barn existed, but like every single detail of it was built by his father, who's like a craftsman in his own right and does it for his son. And um, so that that whole building was it was so old, so many hundreds of years old. And uh, he had to make it so it was safe. But I swear to God, there was the weirdest stuff going on in there. And I know that there's an extra that people may or may not be familiar with if they, they did get the DVD uh, from Vanguard when it was out. Um, but it, there's no doubt that this place had serious ghosts in it. Like, really. It was really, there was like stuff moving and stuff turning on and off and it wasn't a power thing it was it was hard to describe it i have to probably go back myself and rewatch to be reminded of the details of it but just the sightings and oh the biggest thing was this this entity that kept showing up either faintly or sometimes obviously in pictures in photographs and for some reason i don't know why but we all decided that the name of this ghost would be trevor now that's kind of weird and interesting and maybe Specific. because we had a, a lot of our cast was from england and it's i don't know kind of sounds like an english name to me but decided to call him that and that was the end of that it was it was trevor the ghost and he was in so many pictures that they have still to this day they have them it was crazy that's but it awesome. one of the best artistic experiences ever like you know when you pick up a script and and just out of so many scripts this happens so rarely that you pick it up and you're just as you're reading it the first time you are envisioning everything as clear as a bell and you're even already embellishing what you're going to do to add to it that's when the script like speaks to you, just like comes right through and it, it just grabs you and, and speaks to you. And that one did right up, right off the top. And uh, I just want to say, I, I don't want to stay on Zacone for all night either, but I will say that uh, I think Wrath of the Crows is a masterpiece as well. And it gives you as a rare chance to see you and your friend Tiffany Sheffis on screen together, which is an absolute delight in itself. But put that inside a artistically intense horror film and that's amazing uh color from the dark i do want to mention is my favorite adaptation of lovecraft's color out of space um all apologies to people who love the new nicholas cage version but no sorry this is the one yeah <laughs> well i i thank you because i'm a huge fan of the nicholas cage one I am such a massive fan of Yvonne Zaccone that I always feel like what an asshole I am to say that this one's better because I'm in it, right? But it's no, not you're right. It's not that. It's like it's it's Yvonne. It's like, you know, he's so insanely talented. It is my favorite. And I'll tell you something, going back to the top of the show. You have to have thick skin or get the hell out of this business because when Richard Stanley's uh, Color from Space, com Color from Outer Space came out, uh, I think it was Rue Morgue did an update of every version that had been um, done up until that point, like every single one, you know, all the different ones throughout the years. There was maybe four or five of them, uh, Die Monster Die and a couple of other ones. And um, it was all it was all this one particular reviewer. So it's not like the stamp of the magazine because it's whoever's writing the column. But this one particular reviewer, every single one just absolutely tore an asshole through the movie, like including Yvonne's movie. And I was like, how can I, like with no redeeming qualities for that, how could I take this seriously? Like it's and only to uh, come to the Richard Stanley one and that be a uh, genius, which is fine, but to, I mean, you could hate elements of all of them, but just to completely slice and dice every single solitary version prior to Richard Stanley's version, I thought was um, 
a little crazy. So I only throw that in because again, if we're going back to the beginning where, you know, if, if you're sensitive, it sucks, it sucks ass, but it, you know, it happens. I mean, it happens all the time and, and you have to take, you got to enjoy the good because the bad will always, you know, it's always there too. So you just have to have to know how to ride out the good and really enjoy the good when it does happen. Take a moment and enjoy it because there's a lot of the other stuff too. And it can feel really unfair. I mean, that feels really unfair. I feel very, very protective about Yvonne and his work. Um, but, you know, what can I do? I, I can't. To me, it's like it, it's it, to to look at his work and and just poo-poo it top to bottom. I just feel like. Are we watching the same movies? I mean, this guy, he's no. so talented. It's anyway, yeah, I'm belaboring it, but that is like how deeply shocking it is. Like just again, for Yvonne, not for, you know, any of the particular actors you could, you know, like or not like their performance, but as a filmmaker, yeah, he's way up there, way up there in the indie scene. I mean, can, uh, then we will leave him. But um, I will just say this, like, if if I were the Craven Estate looking to see who would make the next Nightmare on Elm Street, can you imagine his visual sense in that franchise? I mean, no. this stuff is easy. I mean, yeah. This isn't tough. This isn't tough decisions. It really isn't. No, no, seri seriously. All you would have to do, and, and I've always felt, and I've always said to him, it's just like a matter of getting your work in front of the right damn person it's only that the work's already there it's not like i want to make a movie you know he's saying it's like all of the work is there because he made multiple movies in italian prior to his okay. three or four i think it's three movies in english and then he did his herbert west going back to italian again now whether love that's because, by the way it was made with no money <laughs> Yeah, no money and again, genius. And and it's it's more than fine whatever language it's in. It's just it supersedes what language it's in, but that's his work. But I've always said, like, my God, my God, if I could somehow get somebody in front of the right person, he's always been the person that I felt like, you know, if I could just, you know, I just wish. Yeah. So, uh, Darren Hay says, Debbie Blackheart. I, I, I suppose that means he loves you. Uh, uh, your good uh, friend John Wood yes. says, I found it, lol. Um, oh, he's and meaning the podcast? Oh, well, good. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Steeler Maniac says, my friend Debbie's a true Scream Queen legend. Well, she'll take legend no matter what. Um, <laughs> but, sure, absolutely, I'll take that. <laughs> um, and our friend Dan has another question for you, and I'm including it because it's a good one, actually. It's, well, not that Dan doesn't ask good questions, but um, he says, any memories of your work with John Backus? Play, Playmate of the Apes is one of the funniest parodies I have seen. I thought you were hilarious as the Doctor. Yes. Dr. Cornholius, I might add. Yes. There you go. Uh, John Backus, who is um, really Zack Snig, which he, I'm sure Dan already knows, but... Um, yeah, I mean, he's, you know, pretty, pretty open about that. Like he would make his own movies. That's kind of how we met. I had to call him in the Joe Bob Briggs report in the 90s. So he had contacted me because he had made a couple of indie movies with his brother. And he had his own, like, completely unique style of filmmaking. And I was just like, I remember watching it. And my my mind was, like, blown because he just had the, the shots and the, it was like, for a lot of people watching Evil Dead, uh, especially two, but one or two for the first time and just watching all of these camera moves that hadn't been done before. Like, try to imagine that, right? That that type of experience. And, and Zack Snake has that, you know, his own visual style, like right out of the gate, so young, which is so, you know, so rare to find your own voice. Took me forever to find mine. So I was blown away with his work. Um, and then, yeah, he was working for um, Seduction Cinema, which is part of Alternative Cinema. 
and their money would be in doing the parodies of the big movies, but then have sort of like the, the sex scenes in between. Now, him and I, even though he was shooting it, um, and uh, John Fidelli and a couple other people, including um, Tina Krause, we would just do the comedy bits in between before it would cut to, um, you know, the, the ladies that were doing the lesbian stuff that people would get the video for. But uh, so that's the John Bacchus, because, of, of course, as most of us know, but not all of us, perhaps, that John Bacchus was the god of sex and, and love or I don't know if he was a god, but he was some sort of uh, what would you call him? Uh, an idol or a in folklore of such Bacchus was the the entity or the symbol of like sex and whatever so that's why i chose that name so when he when i would do those movies he would um he would direct them under that name john bacchus and they were very very funny and the funniest one was probably erotic survivor because again just doing the comedy bits but still he it, it wasn't planned who was going to win and i have to say we were absolutely 1000 percent really playing the game because it was the first year um erotic uh, no, erotic survivor <laughs> erotic so, yeah it's called erotic survivor uh, but uh uh on tv i was like, can't believe i mixed that up but it's very funny but we we really played that game for real and if we the non-sexual group right because it was the lesbians right who won which was good for the guys watching if that you know or or ladies watching that wanted that um but yeah we were like the sort of like oh you know can't believe them you know i was um this uh uh woman who worked for like the the um what was it like the fcc or something like that and then there was uh, this guy named christian who was you know the the way he was and then we had a couple of like uh junkies and uh, we had like this crazy motley crew that was on our team but uh, it was never destined to be that we were <laughs> that we were meant to win even though we were honestly good trying that was really funny though i have to say that one was was really really funny to make Lee Claypool asks, are you doing any conventions this fall? And obviously that um, is, there's, there's some caveats yeah. to that that we all realize, but. Yes. Lee, Lee, how's your daughter doing? I know, I knew that him and his daughter were going to come by tonight. So thanks for doing that. Appreciate it a lot. Um, um, there's already a couple that are doing virtual. Like, for example, in there's a mid-May massacre convention, and I know that's really soon, so of course it's going to be virtual. I really, really think that that there's going to be some actual conventions. I really hope, Lee. I really do. Uh, the problem is, like, okay, the good thing is the vaccines are really rolling out. That's really helpful. The bad news is everybody's got such fatigue and especially um, the younger people want to live their lives already. And I have to put myself in their place and try to understand and not just judge them, right? Even though in my mind, I'm thinking, if you can wear the damn mask for six more months, we will be so far ahead and we'll be able to do the thing. But, you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. So vaccines were all, all of us, I know many people are, completely done now that's a big part of it um at least for me because i've had brain surgery i've had radiation to the brain so it's really not happening me traveling before i get vaccines by my choice i just don't think it's a smart idea um so i really hope so lee i really really hope so i know that there's um a couple of films coming up in the late 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 summer fall time so i mean all these things are going to have to you know we're just going to have to see i think before that there's there's nothing that's um really worth taking that kind of risk before then so i would say conventions with any luck in the fall otherwise you know 
we could all say, let's be safe and just do 2022. I don't know. And I wish I we had. Have you, we have you here. So. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yes. Um, so One day I will be able, but I know we're getting, we're all getting like a little fatigue, whether we actually realize it or not, whether we're actually acknowledging the fact that we are possibly getting a little bit depressed about this. You know, it just, it just is like first six months, it was a little, you know, it threw you off so much that perhaps it didn't bother you as much. But yeah, now it's it's um it's taken its toll on some people. It really is. So all I could say is, you know, mask up people. Mask and be kind and to each other. Yeah. And be very kind. We're still in a position where people out there still need help. Let's be real real cognizant of that. Yeah. Um it's so before I let you yeah. we're running down on time. So I wanted to make sure before we go, I like in the last few years, in particular, before the pandemic, uh, you know, erased the globe, you yeah. have really stepped out into different directions. First, as a director with Model Hunger, and of course now with um, from the underbelly to the underground, which is of course a literary endeavor. So you, it, it, yeah. you're making that turn to controlling your own destiny more than perhaps ever before, and I know that's both awesome and wonderful and i know it has to be on one left side terrifying so tell us about that decision i mean to to really stretch the, your own personal creative muscles right well you know i've always been um with very few exceptions i've always been happiest with my work when i've at least been uh, a collaborator of like what I'm doing, at least in the movie, you know, um, I've never just sort of like walked through something or, or phoned it in. I failed. I've taken a chance that I thought might be cool and failed. You know, I've done that, but I've never, um, so long as I can have like a big creative say, then I can get some sort of satisfaction as an artist out of it. Now, making Model Hunger, this was, you know, great thanks to the writer and producer. James Mogart, um, he really made that happen. So, you know, there's not enough that, that can be said about um, his importance in this. Uh, with that said, he said, whatever you want to do with this, how you want to say it, show it, tell it, um, you know, trim it, change it up, that, you know, do it it's it's you it's your expression you know this, this is the blueprint but yeah but it's all whatever you want to do director's cut final cut and i was i just read the script and i was like i just saw so much potential for it doesn't just have to be about weight but the things that women and now men go through in any aspect be it you know film could be music could be, you know, maybe less so in writing, perhaps, but you know, certainly with social media. Even Don't be so day, sure about that, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, you get podcasts, and now, every, yeah, everything's. So I just think there's there was so much to say that it was uh, that sort of superseded any. Um, it's not like there wasn't like angst, and there wasn't second thoughts and there wasn't uh problems that came up including legal problems that came up you know with certain um elements of it yes there there was but it was all it nothing was easy but that didn't bother me like it it took it its toll on me like i i had to recover it took me a while to recover because of all that it wasn't like this Hey, you know, easy, smooth sailing thing. Everything was a fight from beginning to end. And it, and it took a toll on me, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because when you've really put yourself into something, invested yourself really deeply, sometimes that can happen. It's not going to necessarily be this amazing experience where you're all smiles and it's all great. And you're just, you walk away, skipping down the road, singing a tune. You know, it's going to be like a couple years of like recovery. Woo, woo. Like, you know, just woof. And but you're but you're human, you're feeling it. You're an artist. You know, you you're 
you worked your whole life to try to be sensitive so that you could be one. So these things happen. And um, because it it's not just product and it's like something that you really want to say and you're making something that you would want to see, then, you know, there's uh, a lot of, a lot of st- things that you go through, but yeah, so that was amazing. And I will be doing that again after the pandemic. So there's, there's that, that's one thing. The book also very similar in a lot of ways because you can get on a, a really good role, get a good chunk done. And then because of what you are talking about, dealing with expressing, sharing, uh, it kind of set you back. Like, you know, you have a little bit of a, a reaction to that. Um, I guess if people have such things as ghost writers and stuff, perhaps that maybe they don't have to have some, so many feelings about it because it's being kind of filtered through someone else who's carrying the burden and not every single solitary word. Um, but I wouldn't have it that way because it's so ultra personal and, um, yeah, that's a really, a really big thing. So that's, that's a, my, my most personal big project I'm working on. And just to throw it out there, I'm sure everybody that's, that's watching that I know already knows this, but, um, Greg, of course, is almost at the end of his, um, East of, um, oh, so sorry, Guns of Eden, um, Guns of East of Eden there, James, James, uh, James Dean, um, Guns of Eden, he's very, very close to his final, uh, stretch of fundraising for that. And I have a very, very cool warriors, like a female warriors, bad guy role in it. So that's kind of he's always come up with things that I've always wanted to do. Like in slime city massacre, I loved his 1988 movie because I love like underground New York movies from the seventies and eighties. So that was amazing. Then I played a, a mad scientist, which is something he knew I always wanted to play. So I got to do that in killer rack. And um, now with the warriors, you know, the old, tip of the hat to the warriors type of character. Um, so I just give a shout out to him cause he's in the last couple days of that, uh, guns of Eden. You could probably find that pretty easily. And, um, the book 2022, uh, as opposed to 2021, which was originally the, the, uh, release year prior to the pandemic. And, uh, so 2022, from the underbelly to the underground, meaning from the streets to the underground of cinema. And so that's where I came up with that name from. Um, And then beyond that, please listen to my podcast about really strange, true events. It's like a narrative. I tell a story. I don't interview people like you do. Um, I've, I've done that in the past, but you, you were doing a beautiful job. So I leave that to you. And on mine, I just tell stories about strange and unusual events. Uh, well, I feel like my audience creates strange and unusual events. So <laughs> we have something in common. <laughs> Debbie, where can, where can people keep up with all things, uh, Debbie Roshan? Just uh, to keep it simple, just Debbie Roshan.com. That way you can, if you want to go to the social media, you want to see the links for the podcast. It's all right there. Super easy. That's uh, that's pretty simple and pretty awesome yeah. to have one-stop shop. And Debbie, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on tonight. You know, it's it's been a really tough 12, 14 months, whatever it's been. A lot of people feel pretty isolated, pretty alone. They used to get out to the conventions. They used to get out to the movies. They used to get out to wherever they used to go, and they haven't been able to do that. It's easy for uh, people to get not just depressed, but to not be sure that the world will ever come back to its uh, old state. And that kind of fear is in us. You even just coming on my little show and talking to people for an hour means the world to people, and don't underestimate it. So I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, you've been awesome. I hope you'll come back at some point. Yes. And... 
We've only scratched the surface, my friend. Well, they make a cream for that. That's true. And All I right. To, and I ought to get it. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> Everyone out there, please stay safe. Thank you for watching and stay safe. And we will see you real soon. I am, This show will be back on Friday evening um, with uh, Sam Carlson of the Chibi-Jibis podcast. She'll be joining me for about an hour. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about, about the horror genre from about a 400-mile uh, view from over top the earth. Thanks a lot, everyone. Talk to you. Be good. <laughs>